Alice Ayers, President and CEO here at AHP, and we are thrilled to be hosting today's session. I'd also like to introduce Mike Eggert, whom you've heard on the line with Association Research, Inc., who is our partner in the work we do every year for the Report on Giving and Benchmarking, and is our host in terms of the webinar itself today. We'll hear him managing the, the, uh, the system itself, so if you have questions, please uh, send them in his direction. Um, I'd also like to introduce Jasmine Jones, who is our research specialist here at AHP. And additionally, we're lucky to have Jory Pritchard Kerr, FAHP, former AHP board chair and executive director of Collingwood General and Marine Hospital Foundation in Collingwood, Ontario, and Randy Varju, FAHP CFRE, AHP board chair and chief development officer and foundation president of Advocate Aurora Health Foundations in Illinois. But before we get going, I wanted to just do a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that when you entered the call, you were automatically put on mute. And uh, if you could keep yourself muted, that would be terrific. It, it dramatically reduces the amount of background noise on a call with as many participants as this one has. Um, the second is we will be taking questions for the panelists. And to the right on your screen, you should see a chat box. Please go ahead and type any questions you have in there, and we will try to get to all of them. Um, and we're really hoping this will be interactive, so would love to get questions from the group assembled. Third, we will be recording the webinar, and we'll send out a link via email in the next couple of days to all of you so that you have access to uh, the recording. Alrighty, let's get started. As I mentioned, Jasmine Jones, Research Specialist at AHP, is with us, and I'd like to ask you, Jasmine, to take us through a quick history of the report on giving and benchmarking, um, as well as share with the group the kinds of data and reporting that they can expect from the study. Yeah, um, thank you, Alice. Um, again, I'm Jasmine Jones. I'm the Research Specialist here at AHP. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the report on giving, um, we've been doing it since 1984, so this year we'll release the 34th edition. Um, and it's pretty much an annual report that we release um, and we uh, get help from Association Research Inc. and also Peer Focus. Um, and it includes data about fundraising performance and healthcare philanthropy. Um, all the data is uh, collected from a yearly survey that we distribute to our members and prospects. Um, and they're all from a range of different entity types and sizes and uh, different regions from the US and Canada. Um, this year we had 210 US responses and 34 Canadian responses. Um, and real quick, I'm just going to share some of the uh, key data points that we found from this year's report. Um, and just to let you know as well, the full report will be available to participants for free. Um, and we're currently doing pre-orders on our website as well. Um, and the full report should be released uh, within the next week or two. So uh, right now I'm just going to go through total funds raised, um, return on investment, and cost to raise a dollar for both the U.S. and Canada, and just some of the key changes from this year and last year. Um, in the U.S., we saw an increase of 2.9% in total funds raised from $10.1 billion to $10.4 billion. Um, in return on investment, uh, it's slightly decreased compared to last year from $4.06 to $4.03. And in cost to raise a dollar, it stayed relatively the same in the U.S. Um, at 25 cents. And in Canada, um, we also saw an increase in total funds raised by 7.4% from 1.5 billion to 1.645 billion. Um, and we also saw an increase in return on investment um, uh, uh, by $4.07 last year to $4.18 this year. Um, and we saw a slight decrease in cost to raise a dollar um, from 25 cents to 24 cents this year. Um, and next, I'm just going to do a quick rundown of the different levels of benchmarking that we offer, um, just because we're going to mention a lot of this on today's call. Um, so first, we have the, per, uh, the uh, participation level of uh, benchmarking, where you get a uh, performance scorecard. Um, this scorecard is free to all participants, um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this in the next slide. Um, next, we have the basic subscription level, which includes the scorecard and four additional reports. Um, this includes five-year trend data, um, summary survey data, um, and it also includes uh, management monitors by program type. And this includes things like cost to raise a dollar and return on investment. Um, and then next we have the advanced subscription, which includes all of the basic subscription reports um, in, additional, uh, in addition to 20 other reports. Um, and this kind of breaks down the data by survey section and by program area. 
So this is what the performance scorecard looks like. I'm sure a lot of you on the line are participants and you've seen this before. Um, so this pr uh, pretty much includes um, uh, return on investment data, cost to raise a dollar, uh, net fundraising revenue and cash and production, as well as per direct staff FTE, um, and also uh, total fundraising expenses and total endowment value. Um, here you can see that we're just uh, comparing our data to all participants from this past year. Um, and in the yellow here, you can see our demonstration hospital data. Um, but if you were to participate in the survey and you were to run your scorecard, you would see your own uh, organization's data here. Um, and then next, this is what a basic subscriber um, uh, report looks like. This is the five-year trends uh, report. Um, and again, this just includes our demo at demo hospital data. Um, and this also is just comparing um, to all of the benchmarking participants from this year. Um, this report can also show uh, total endowment values, uh, total fundraising expenses, return on investment, and cost to raise a dollar. And lastly, we have um, our advanced subscription uh, report. Um, this just shows a uh, just one section of the survey. This is the direct HR section. Um, uh, you can view all this information in summary or detail. Here we just see it in summary, um, but you can also see it in detail where it'll break it down by each data point that we ask for um, from each uh, direct staff title position. Um, so if you have any questions about the uh, published report when it comes out, the benchmarking subscriptions, or how to participate next year, um, we'll have all of our contact information at the end of the webinar, so feel free to reach out to us. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to Alice, and she's going to get into the main discussion for today. Thank you, Jasmine. Now let me reintroduce our panelists, Randy Varju, CDO and Foundation President at Advocate Aurora Health Foundations, and Jory Pritchard Kerr, Executive Director of Collingwood General and Marine Hospital Foundation in Ontario. This picture was taken a couple of weeks ago in San Diego, and I love it because they're both wearing their FAHP medals in addition to uh, being there together. So wonderful picture to share. Um, they have both been longtime participants in the AHP benchmarking work, and both use the results to help educate their boards, C-suite partners, and others in their ecosphere on the importance of philanthropy. Um, and so I thought I would just jump right in, Jory, with you. Why do you participate in the survey, um, and, and you know, who do you compare yourself with, and how do you use it? Thanks, Alice. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I think one of the things that is unique about us is that we are a very, very small hospital in Ontario, Canada. And uh, so it's difficult sometimes for us to use the data to um, compare against other uh, comparison groups because we are so small. What we do use it for though is to benchmark against ourselves. And we use the overall report to look at what the high performers are doing and figure out where we should be investing our dollars to continuously grow our net fundraising revenue. The other thing that we do is we use it for a teaching type, um, tool for our board members. It's something to make them understand um, you know, how, how revenues can fluctuate, especially during campaign cycles, and we want them to understand exactly you know, a, a long-term look at what's going on. So we actually go back 10 years in our data and show them our trends every year over a 10-year period. So that when we say to them, you know, we're going into campaign, we're going to have to spend to um, kind of uh, up staff during the campaign, and then they see big revenues coming in in the campaign, and then I explain to them that, you know, next year you're going to expect to see these go down, and by using the benchmarking data, we can show that to them. We can validate to them that this is what happens across the industry, and it's not something to be worried about but something, um, a way, a tool that they can use to determine whether or not the investments we're asking for are valid and will pay off in the end. That's great. I, I know how important it is to be able to especially sort of smooth out some of those trends. And Randy, when we were talking earlier, I know you use the report on giving um, and benchmarking information around education as well. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how you use it to educate um, your your board and, and others within your universe? Sure. So um, first, a, a little picture of our universe. And I, I think we're at one of the other ends of the spectrum, maybe in the middle, as it relates to size of systems that are taking shape. And uh, some of you may be aware of the merger with Advocate Healthcare and Aurora Health. So we now cover two different states 
with 27 hospitals, 500 sites of care, uh, more than 8,000 physicians, 70,000 team members. So you can imagine the governance structure and volunteer network is fairly complex in a system of this size. And now that we're both in Illinois and Wisconsin, um, that challenge continues to grow and evolve. So I think the importance of benchmarking is something that we're fortunate we've been doing for quite some time and interpreting the results accordingly in meaningful ways for not only volunteers to see where we rank, but better to use the educational process with executives and other partners to understand that there are standards, there are metrics, there are others that are measuring all of these variables and almost bring a common understanding to the science behind the work that we're doing. But I think beyond that, it, it's also driven by how much change do we want to inflect, whether it's incremental or transformational. And many times when you're looking at benchmark, the realization is that these are all lagging indicators by the time you see the information in its aggregate form. You almost have to look back to determine what are those practices that you can influence or even change a little bit through determining what the lead activities are that are going to drive some of these outcomes. So we've interpreted it much more from that perspective in determining then what measurements do we really want to improve or really want to assess, evaluate with some of our partners and then determine what our appropriate range would be based on our capacity and how do we reach more of that capacity by driving activities. And that needs to be a collaborative process that the volunteers and the senior leadership understand, but the team members embrace as part of our culture of high performance and looking to uh, always improve and find innovative and creative ways to uh, raise more dollars for the impact that we're able to have in transforming care. It's interesting to think of it as a lagging benchmark, which of course it is, and then think about how you identify leading um, performance metrics and, and sort of think about how to move forward. Are there things, uh, Jory, that you have done at Collingwood differently as a result of the information that comes from the survey? Oh, absolutely. We have sort of turned ourselves on our heads and, and gone the other way. The one thing I might just um, uh, note, Alice, at the outset is that one of the things that I hear a lot from people who aren't participating in this program is they're, um, they're afraid of the information their board will find out from benchmarking. And the first thing that I did with our board was to tell them that um, you know, this was a process that we're using to improve our practices and that they might not like the data that they see in the first year, but our goal was to make sure that that data improved continuously over the years with benchmarking. So, you know, you can't be afraid to have that conversation um, with your C-suite or uh, with your board to say, this is all about improving. And so we started kind of a, you know, fairly low level and said that we wanted to look at the high performers through benchmarking to determine what they were doing differently from us. And of course, the biggest thing that came out of it was that we needed to shift our practices um, from events and annual giving driven more to um, major gift and plan giving. And we were able to talk to our board about the investments in those areas based on the data from the high performers. And it has certainly um, significantly increased our revenue. And in fact, we've probably about quadrupled over the last 10 years what we've been able to, ra uh, to raise basically because we realigned our staff in our program focus. And we made sure if we were doing events, um, they had a major gift strategy to them so that it wasn't about how much we raised at the event, more about um, how many new major gift prospects we brought in and what we did with them during the event um, that really was sort of driving our program now. So benchmarking really has allowed us to see that and to demonstrate to our board the importance of it, and we've seen the outcomes. Randy, how about you as you think about uh, the things that you're you're dealing with, especially as you bring together Advocate and Aurora, what are the things that the survey has helped you to change? I think the first thing is just the credibility and stature that having a ready-made benchmarking process in place when you're forming a new partnership with a new system or merging with a new partner or even integrating an individual hospital, it, it does at least 
provide that level of a starting point where there are practices that are common that we'll be looking for, that there are um, measures that are part of determining what success looks like. So I think that all becomes part of the evolving culture as teams come together. But I think it's also in looking at the benchmarking and interpreting what the data is telling you. And are there areas of underperformance or are there areas of staffing needs that are reflected in the information? So I, I think unless you've benchmarked before and know the data that you're looking at, it can sometimes be a little overwhelming when you get all of the information at once. But you know, we're fortunate that we have a cohort that we compare ourselves to, and there's a number of key metrics that we look at, whether it's dollars raised per major gift FTE, and if we're ranking towards the middle of the pack, you know, that's one thing that we can look at, but it's not so much where we rank within that overall network of high performers. Like Jory was saying a little bit earlier, it's how do we compare against our own standards and what do we feel based on our capacity or based on our demographics or our footprint and reach, what would be that appropriate range given our size and the level of staffing that we currently have. And if we're in alignment with that as part of a leadership team, and that then takes hold as far as the, you know, the X plus Y by what time, you know, where do we want to be by this time next year, that will drive some of those activities, the goal setting, the performance standards, how we hold each other accountable. It all becomes part of that, that new team dynamic that's taking hold. And it also helps in the broader conversation then when we're looking at where do we allocate limited resources. If we've got a set number of FTEs and we have some of those to allocate accordingly, I know specifically what those priorities are based on what the data is telling us and where we'll get the best return on those FTEs when they're applied appropriately. Another way that I, I know, Jory, you use the data is to actually talk with donors about it. Can you talk about that? I think that's something that um, some people might not have thought of to do. Yes, we find it as an, um, it's an excellent tool to bring out to speak to new prospective major donors, especially those people who have, um, have been in industry, um, you know, and are used to good sound financial practices. We're in a very small town, and so people are very cognizant of, you know, how much charities spend. But it allows us to really move that conversation from cost to raise a dollar to the return on investment. We look at, as I said, the 10-year data, and the donors are impressed that the board pays such attention to those issues, and that we can explain to them what the cycles are going are, are over the past 10 years. And even as we're sort of on the cusp of a major campaign, we can explain what they can expect over the next couple of years too, as well as our, our returns, because we have such a kind of a depth of information within the organization. And it's, it's something that really makes, um, it builds a lot of trust with donors that we're willing to open up to that extent to them and answer their questions directly, even before they're asked. Interesting. And Randy, I know you use the data um, to, to work with volunteers and with your own staff. Can you talk about how you're using the information to, to help them understand the overall uh, strength of the organization and the mission? I think it gets back to that uh, high performance culture and what's our tolerance for variability. And while we want to be genuine to relationships that we know that each of our major gift officers have with the audience that they're working with. There are certain standards and accountabilities that as part of our team dynamic, we're focused on and they help identify what those key lead indicators or activities will be that drive these outcomes based on the data that we're able to look through in comparison to some of the others that we benchmark against. So it's, it's a culture of looking at the, the um, execution of strategy that's founded in information that they have readily available and can interpret on their own. You know, another instance of the ROI question is, you know, what is that information telling us? In some cases, if we have a very high ROI, is it also reflective of missed opportunity? That if we were to staff up and ask for more gifts while our cost to raise that dollar may go down a little bit, we may raise far more dollars in total 
that would compensate for that. So those are all part of the pieces that we're looking at when we're interpreting the data and determining what direction this means for various teams. And it's also reflective of the geographies that each of our teams represent. Now with 27 different hospitals, we're in very different dynamics. So when we benchmark against ourselves, we're able to find those common metrics that will determine what those outcomes could be if we were able to focus more in a specific area. You both dig in really deeply to the data and think, I think, pretty carefully about what it's telling you. Um, Randy, I know you had mentioned to, to me that um, one of the things you were seeing as a result of this was uh, uh, the beginnings of growth in, in uh, gift planning and planned gifts. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how what you've learned from the benchmarking data helped you there? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of trends that we're always looking for. And one is if you were to look at proportionately where your gifts are coming from, whether it's gift planning, whether it's events, whether it's annual fund, or any of the other components that make up your overall philanthropic pie chart. In our case, we were noticing that a lot of our gifts that were coming in, major, um, major gifts in particular, those that are six figures and above, or sometimes the mid five figures, had elements of gift planning or uh, mixed gifts that had elements of cash and also gift planning. So as a result of that, we focused more on that as a key strategy with some of our upper end donors to determine whether or not there was additional potential there. So, you know, I think that is one area where we've identified a key strength where our gift planning team can then be more proactive in major gift strategies with each of the gift officers as they're looking ahead two to three weeks to determine who's in their solicitation cycle and what types of mixed gift opportunities might be available to proactively anticipate this as an opportunity. So, you know, we'll start with the typical uh, multi-year pledge conversation, but of course, if there's an opportunity to go even further with a mixed gift or a planned gift, then that becomes part of the conversation. And we even work that into the preps of the conversation with each of the gift officers. Likewise, you know, I think the other components of that proportionate makeup of the overall philanthropic landscape, you know, like Jory mentioned a little bit earlier, we've, we've noticed that we're probably a little heavier than we should be in events. And some of that, I would hope, relates back to the point that she made that we are leveraging those as major gift opportunities to either elevate the stature of philanthropy in the community where they're held or we're looking to expand the network and reach of those that we have in attendance with replenishing our portfolio of major gift prospects or we're using it as a sense of urgency to close that major gift strategy that has been pending for quite some time. So, you know, how do you look at each of those different components what does the data tell you and, and what do you do with that data then to proactively inflect some of these new strategies and outcomes that you can predict? Jory, I know you had talked about that shift from, uh, and, and even the FTE shift from events to major gifts. And I also noticed that there was a good jump in your production number this year um, you know, what are you seeing and what are you what are you kind of seeing as the key insights and the things that you've changed and how it's been working? Well, one of the things that, you know, when when you go into into benchmarking and high performance, you know that if you're going into capital campaign, you're always going to do better. And so we're on the cusp of a capital campaign, which has really um, taken our donors to a new level when you when you have a large goal to achieve, they tend to move with you. And so we've been able to speak to donors now about you know multiple million dollar gifts as opposed to 100,000 or 250,000 which has really made a difference i think to our returns but we've also seen a, a big increase in our um our, our bequest expectancies as we call them um, individuals who are indicating to us that they're leaving something in their will or an insurance policy and it's it's taken some time because we first chose to invest heavily into uh, plan giving in 2007, 2008. But now, uh, last year we had four one million dollar plus gift expectancies um, notified to us. So again, it's about making sure that you're resourced in the right areas um, to push those gifts forward. But the other thing too that I think sometimes we lose track of is 
you know, we have to have so many major gift officers or plan giving officers or whatever, but they need to be resourced properly too. And so you need to make sure that you're, you're um, having the right number of FTEs and clerical positions that are going to support those gift officers so that the gift officers are doing what they're, they're supposed to be doing, which I think is extremely important. But, you know, the, the thing about um, having a long-term look at this data is that you can see where you've made those investments, the time that it's taken to, um, to pay off, and really then, um, you know, look back again and say, okay, do we have the right mix now? Or because we've moved to this next level, do we need to be changing our mix up again? Luckily, I think we're, we have the right mix right now of staff and they're allocated properly. You know, I think that's a key point that you just made, uh, Jory, the, the longer term viewpoint of some of the benchmarking. So we've committed to this longer term and it's not a one and done type mentality. You can't just benchmark once, see where you rank and then say, okay, well, that didn't help us much. You really do need to see at least I would think a five to, or maybe even longer term, uh, five year to 10 year term um, of where this data is in inflection points. And I think campaigns are a good example of that. We've had uh, years where we, we've had five different campaigns at five different life stages, and that shows itself in certain ways within the data. So when we're not in a campaign, we can then determine where we need to focus more on production capacity and what are we doing differently with our gift officers to offer those opportunities and anticipate what impact that's going to have on our overall benchmarking results. But knowing that that's a time specific area that requires attention in a post campaign environment is important because those resources are just as valuable as leading into a campaign. Sustaining those results longer term adds then an element of credibility to the work that we're doing then with those volunteers and they can see that we're scientifically attentive to what the data is telling us, but we're also genuinely committed to the relationships necessary in building those in successive fashion to see that we can sustain the, the impact in the numbers that the systems are expecting us to have. So you are both so sophisticated when it comes to the way that you think about this. Um, and it's, it's in part because you've had a number of years where you've really dug into it. But think back if you would. What advice would you give somebody who says, gosh, I'm just starting and honestly, I really don't even know where to start. Um, how would you go about kind of beginning a journey with the report on giving and benchmarking? Randy, how about you first? Well, you know, there's no substitute for just stepping on the scale and knowing where you are currently and then determining from that first effort what you want to improve, but it gives you a roadmap for what you need to address and how you might go about chipping away at some of those real challenges that exist in the environment that you're in. I, you know, I think when we first started benchmarking, we were at a point where we had no idea what our capacity was, but it gave us a better indication of what it would mean to hit the certain thresholds that systems of our size were hitting. So there's value there, but I, I don't want to make it sound so easy because it is a lot of work. It's, it's not easy to pull all the reports necessary to sub submit the data, but I, I can honestly say that it, it has been worth it in our case because we've used it accordingly and we've valued what it has shown us and improved activities and actions and developed a culture where there's this expectation that people will see the data, interpret it for their own needs, de determine what their goals and action steps might be for the coming year, and then see the impact that that has on the numbers the next time around. So, you know, if you can build that culture of execution where you know where you are currently, what you want to improve and, and solidly develop some practices that become part of your culture, it, it does pay off, but it does require some significant commitment. Jory, what advice would you give people who are starting out? Well, I, I think the first thing that you have to realize is that you don't have to jump totally into the, the big benchmarking tool. We started out in the big benchmarking tool and, you know, being a small shop, we struggled to pull the data and to get it in and it took a lot of time. 
but we learned so much from it that we were then able to say, okay, we're going to take a little break and go to the report on giving. The report on giving is a, a light version of benchmarking, but it's also a lot easier to be able to enter the data. And once you know, um, once you set up those data polls, you know, in, in the first year, you can use them year over year over year. And I always say, you know, to my staff, you don't know what success is and, until you have defined your your starting point. So you may think you're doing really well, and maybe you are, and, and that's great, but how do you know for sure? And how do you know whether you're improving if you're not measuring the same thing year over year over year? And that's really what Report on Giving and Benchmarking forces you to do, is to measure in the same way the same numbers uh, so that you know that you're getting consistent, da consistent data back out of it. And I just find it frustrating that more small organizations aren't taking the time to do this because it's really um, a good planning tool that AHP offers to us that you're, you're not able to get anywhere else. And if you take the time to put the data in, the information that you will get back out again will be you know, worth its weight in gold. So you know, don't be afraid of the numbers stick your toe in, do the report on giving, and uh, and learn from it. And the other thing is, you can contact other participants and ask what they're doing. That's a really valuable piece of this product. Yeah, this is, I, gonna, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing I just wanted to throw in there when I was listening to Jory. Uh, thank you on that. I, just, I thought I'd mention for the new participants or people who, if you have turnover, um, the platform that HP uses allows us to pre-populate the data that was entered for the previous year. So as Jory was mentioning, you know, as you, you do one year and then you do the next year, um, if you did participate consecutively, uh, even if you had staff turnover, you're going to see the data that was entered by the previous staff person there um, throughout the survey. And it, uh, it's obviously helpful. It's a sanity check for the person, maybe a new person filling it out. If they're coming up with numbers that are significantly different, it's not directly related to, oh, well, it was a capital campaign or some unusual thing that happened. So I just wanted to point that out that there's, uh, on the platform itself, it is something that's uh, very helpful uh, for people filling it out. Thanks, Mike. And Randy, it sounded like you had something you wanted to add to the, the question of jumping in to the benchmarking survey. Yeah, I, I think um, the participation of systems as well as smaller sites and hospital um, standalone uh, sites, I, it's important because the validity of the data is driven by the number of participants in many ways. In our case, when we were looking for appropriate benchmarking uh, resources, the AHP study stood out not only because of its its tenure and length uh, and historical uh, cumulative uh, data that we can look at, but it was also the behind the scenes work that's done to shake out the data and make sure that it's comparative to like entities. As And, and while we all have a great deal of unique facets to our environment and, and the work that we do and the systems we represent, they really have done a great job in determining what are those standard pieces of data that we can all look at that make us look similar and become a valid point of comparison. So that really stood out for us. I'm going to open it up to questions here, so please go ahead and start plugging them into the chat box if you uh, have any. But I, while I'm giving everybody a chance to do that, I will ask one last question myself. Um, Jory, when you think about uh, the benchmarking data um, and you think about sort of trends that, that you see within the healthcare landscape, you know, how have those how those trends affected your performance and, and how do you see that within the data? Well, I, I think probably the uh, most important thing that it has taught us by looking at the high performers is that um, investment is the road to um, greater net fundraising revenue. You know, cost cutting a strategy, it might be a short term strategy, but it's not a good one um, and it, it you know, won't give you long-term effects. I think about the market crash in 2008. 
um, you know, when a lot of foundations pulled back, and you could see that through the benchmarking data, they pulled back, they cut costs, um, cut investments, and sort of hunkered down. We looked at the data and looked at what the high performers had been doing, and I said to my board, this is not the time to be cutting costs. We need to uh, reallocate the budget that we have perhaps more to stewardship and communication with our donors uh, so that when we come out of this um, you know, market crash, we're going to be the first ones that they're thinking about. And so we maintained, even increased our budget a little bit during that time based on what we've learned from the high performers. And we came out of that market crash very, very strongly in 2009 and 2010. So that's probably the, the biggest um, lesson that it taught us that, um, you know, cost cutting is not, is not a long-term strategy. You need to look for wise investment and look at those people who are really doing well to figure out where you should be investing. And Randy, how about you? Trends that you see that, that Report on Giving helps you understand better? I, I think um, there's a number, uh, but I think the sophistication of our profession and how quickly it's advancing and the availability of data like the benchmarking information that we get back in order to inflect different strategies or uh, influence certain strategic decisions at the system level, like Jory was mentioning, I think those are all important. I think it also brings a level of legitimacy to the the work that we're doing in support of many of the institutions that we represent. And I, if there's a way for us to show the, the data and its impact on the overall numbers and how we sustain those numbers longer term without the typical peaks and valleys, then it really does make a difference and provides value beyond just the numbers on the page or on a PowerPoint presentation. You know, I, I think that when we can show that instead of cutting costs, but investing wisely and strategically in areas where we know it will have an impact, we can sustain those results in a more predictable fashion. It's also interesting that you know, some of the data shows us that many times the gift officers that are most successful are the ones that have more than a two-year tenure. They typically get to a point where they understand the system, they know the portfolio, and they really start to hit some of their numbers more consistently at the three-year threshold. So what does that say as far as what we need to do in order to retain some of those high performers or offer them opportunity for growth in areas that they have an interest? So it, it's more than just the overall outcomes or the big numbers that we're expected to hit, it's what is it doing to drive each of those strategies that are part of managing a team and driving a workforce consistently to those outcomes with heightened energy and a, a true sense of collaboration and buy-in to what we're looking to, to achieve as a team. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Mark. Does the benchmarking data provide information on various aspects of annual giving, acquisition, retention, long last recapture, various types of institutions? Um, I don't know whether either Randy or Jory, you'd like to answer that one or Jasmine, yeah, whether you... Yeah, so in our most recent assessment, we just had some of our fresh data, and one of the things that jumped out at me is, you know, we were looking at that proportionate makeup of our philanthropic mix, and we've seen, at least over the last two years, a, a drop in our annual uh, giving components, which to me means that we're not doing enough to replenish our portfolios for developing future gift capacity. So that then will be part of the strategies that we'll be paying more attention to in the, the coming year. Are we identifying enough of those names? Have we run them through the wealth screening that we typically would do? How do we build a, a deeper affinity through engagement activities at some of our events that then reflect some of the annual giving component messages that we've used intentionally to build those genuine relationships. So you know, it, it is an area that is important to include in the benchmarking. And in our case, it certainly has driven some of our focus for this, this next coming term. Jory, did you have thoughts as well here? Uh, no, I think Randy's covered that fairly well. And I mean, it's, it's really looking at, you know, what you're, where your donors are, are you 
it, we're looking at our retention rate um, continuously um, in all of our programs, but um, we we do that actually separately outside of benchmarking. Excellent. Are there any other questions from anyone on the call? You can just type them right into the chat. Mike, did you get any? Oh, we've got a couple here. All right. Um, does benchmarking and data analysis help build respect for philanthropy among the C-suite at your organization? Jory, you want to take that one first? I would say absolutely. Um, you know, we being in the Canadian system, it's a little bit of a different relationship with the C-suite. I answer directly to a board, not to the CEO of the hospital, but it's it's really demonstrated to uh, the C-suite of the hospital that we are, you know, we are a, a driven organization just like they are and that we're looking for, um, you know, quality improvement on a regular basis. Randy, I know you've, during the course of the, the merger of the two organizations, you've, you've had um, obviously the need to ensure that both of the C-suites and all of the leadership sort of have a, an understanding of philanthropy. Has, has some of the benchmarking data come into play as you've worked through um, that, that uh, marriage of, of organizations? It has, and um, we're working to get the full landscape of data. And um, while we've been able to, on the legacy advocate side, show where we compare or who we compare to, because we do have a cohort of 15 other systems that we unblind our information with and share openly some of our, our practices. Um, that has provided some valuable insight to the new members of the merged entity, especially around the amount of detail that drives our focus and what types of activities we're really reinforcing to sustain some of those outcomes. And it also, I think from a broader sense for the team members within the foundation on the Aurora side, has provided them some reassurance that yes, this is a good merger. It's a team that understands the rigor of the work that is necessary to become and consistently perform at that high caliber. And I think it also has helped them understand that there are things that they're doing well mm -hmm. when we look at their information. So it brings that partnership in a true sense to, to bear and offers some areas for celebration as well as recognition as opposed to simply saying, well, our way is better. So I, I think it's, it's a, a, a careful balance of practices that you want to recognize as well as practices that you know the team needs to come together around and be focused on. So in, in our sense, I would say absolutely, it's been important in not only underscoring the work that we've done as far as being this top performing entity, but it's also what areas are we focused on and bringing together as a reflection of this new entity, not necessarily best practices from either course, but new practices as we're merged and focused on some of the data and what it's telling us. Another good question from, uh, from somebody on the line, Nick Wagner. If the first benchmarking provides a general orientation when you get to years two, three, or four of benchmarking, what's the data you're most eager to revisit? So what are you looking for when you, when you open it up again every year? What are you the most excited about benchmarking against the years previous? I, I think that, you know, what we look for is the change. We will make strategic investments in certain areas and we want to determine whether or not that investment has paid off because, you know, quite often that's how I get my next investment from the board. <laughs> So, you know, we, if we're targeting a certain area and we've said, okay, we're going to invest more resources in this area, we want to see what's their impact. Um, you know, did it grow quickly? Did it grow slowly? Um, you know, and, and I will generally talk to the board while we're doing the budgeting about how I believe this investment will pay off in the future. And I, I really like to know whether or not what I've told them is correct. <laughs> Excellent. Randy? 
I, it's, um, I think this year we've focused a lot on dollars raised per major gift FTE. So, of course, when we see the information and we compare ourselves to previous years or to those that we aspire to be more like, are we keeping pace? Are we doing what's necessary? So I, it gets back to each of those teams that have identified those as priorities and determine what those practices are that they're improving or changing or redefining and then seeing what reflective impact it's had on the overall ranking of where we are with our peers, but also where we are in, in accordance with ourselves. And is it something that needs further attention? Is there a different metric that then raises to the level of the, uh, the focused attention? So it's just kind of interesting from year to year, it might be a different metric, but I, you know, I think it's natural for everyone to just see their bigger number and where they rank as far as the overall FTEs versus the dollars raised. And there are some specifics that all of us do look at, but I, I think if you dive deeper, you can find something from year to year where you can show that you're making marked improvement and that those really might be the most valuable components for your team when you're looking to drive this culture of high performance. Excellent. Thank you. I want to thank both Randy and Jory for spending the time with all of us and sharing all of your insights. There were so many different ways that you think about using this information um, that I think it'll be enormously helpful to all of us to be able to begin thinking about using it in the same ways. I also want to just do one uh, little advertisement for the next webinar that is um, going to be uh, a panel of three of our operations leaders within philanthropy, Carrie Boardwick, CFRE, Vice President Philanthropy Operations at uh, MedStar, Nancy Gregovich, Foundations Operations Officer at Intermountain, and Tamara Von Schreck, Senior Director of Operations and Finance Philanthropy at Dignity Health. The three of them will be focused on uh, really helping all of the uh, operations professionals within our industry as they think about how to use that data. So if you are on the call and you work with a uh, uh, operations professional within your organization, please let them know that we'll be hosting a webinar on the 6th of December with this group. It should be a great uh, opportunity. Again, many, many, many thanks to Randy and Jory. If you have any questions or need anything Post the webinar. Here is information on how to get a hold of me, uh, Jasmine Jones, and Mike Eggert. So we are all here to, to help and answer questions on everything from the content within the webinar to any questions you have around using your benchmarking data and using the report on giving. And thanks to you all for joining us and spending 50 minutes with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it.